Welcome to the Fat Fuel Family Podcast, where every week, Danny and Mauda Vega discuss topics that help families live a healthy and active lifestyle with their little ones, including nutrition and training, peaceful parenting, education, and mindset. To stay up to date, make sure to hit subscribe on this podcast and check out the blog at www.fatfuel.family. You can also find them on Facebook and Instagram at dannyvega.ms, at fatfueledmom, and at fatfueledkids, and fatfueledfamily on YouTube. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Fat Fuel Family Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Vega, and I'm joined by someone today who hates, hates cardio as much as our guest. My love, how are you? I'm doing great because <laughs> I'm not doing cardio. <laughs> she's doing good because she's not doing low intensity, you know, steady yeah. state. Every day that I don't feel the need to do cardio is a okay with me. All right. So listen, we first of all want to give a shout out to Cynthia. She was just at the Olympic Training Center and she just had a 59.22 in the 400, which is the fastest time Amazing. in the world. Amazing. Um, so I wanted to give her a quick shout out. But uh, CM, otherwise known as Cynthia Monteleone, is a wife and mother of three children. She's a certified metabolic analytics practitioner with many world class level athletes as clients. However, she works with all levels of clients to help them perform in life at their optimal level, whether it be weight loss, hormonal balance, or getting strong. Cynthia can offer the best advice and protocols. Cynthia is a world champion track athlete who specializes in the 400 meters. She competes for Team USA in Masters Athletics. She's also a 2018 national champion in the 200 meters, 400 meters, 4x200, which is a national record, 4x100, which is a national record, and 4x400, which is a national record relays. In addition, she anchored the world champion gold medal record setting 4x400 Team uh, UA team in 2018. She was uh, both a national and world champion in 2019. She also coaches track and field at the high school and club levels. And Cynthia's experience and expertise allows her to help each individual reach their goals. This is just the sweetest woman. We had this great conversation uh, just in her backyard. I know, in beautiful Hawaii. Beautiful Hawaii. And um, there was one more thing I I did want to mention. She's amazing. Oh, yeah, she is amazing. (laughs) She just... She's definitely someone you want to listen to. Oh, she had a bunch of really good um, just advice on this on if you want to get into sprinting, how do you how do you get started? Some really good progressions. So I definitely encourage everyone to listen to this episode, especially uh, I'm going to say also for anyone in my age group, you know, like the 40 to 55, 60, um, you know, don't don't write yourself off as not being able to do things like sprints and, and jumping and intensive stuff because like Cynthia says, it, it helps strengthen your bones more than, you know, steady state cardio. And so there's just a bunch of benefits. Yeah, I would definitely listen to her as far as longevity and just it's all anti-aging. So in the middle of her 40s, she looks, she looks amazing. She looks amazing. Better than, you know, most 30 year olds. So uh, definitely someone to listen to. And we hope you guys enjoy it. Enjoy, guys. What's that? Oh, this? Yeah. It's just my uh, keto brick. Keto brick? What, what's, what's a keto brick? Well, keto brick, well, it's an actual brick, which is awesome <laughs> because it lasts me a really long time. Can't say the same for you. Nope. <laughs> but keto brick is um, an awesome keto-friendly snack that um, it could be used so many ways, you guys, seriously. But it is keto-friendly, high-fat, low-carb, has really, really good macros. It's shelf-stable, which I love because I like to take it with me when I leave the house with the kids. Um, and it's got no sweeteners, none of the crap that we're usually staying away from. So no allulose, erythritol, corn fiber, um, soy, any of that stuff that we're usually avoiding. But it makes such a great snack. I also love it just as a treat. I like to put it in my coffee and the kids love it. So that's a plus. I totally agree. And I have one of these every single day. <laughs> An entire brick. Uh, yeah, I like to, everybody knows I like to crush mine up into cereal um, and have it like a cereal. My current favorite flavors are peanut butter and chocolate peanut butter cup, which we have right here next to us. What about you? I really love the peanut butter because it's nice and smooth, but my my other favorite flavor would probably be toasted coconut. Yeah, toasted that almond coconut really is amazing. Um, and yeah, of course, as you all know, we are great friends with the owners of this company, Robert Sykes and Crystal Sykes. And both of them, when this started, they were just wrapping these things up in aluminum foil and shipping them out themselves. 
pulling all-nighters, and here we are several years later. It's an amazing company, guys. They have vegan options, vegan-friendly options, as well as whey options. So the two flavors that I mentioned are uh, chocolate peanut butter cup and peanut butter, and the chocolate peanut butter cup is whey, and the peanut butter is with the pea protein. So if you don't tolerate whey, no worries, or if you're on a vegan diet, no worries, you can have the peanut butter. So guys, click on the link in the description of this podcast episode and check out the Keto Bricks ASAP. It gets the Fat Fuel family seal of approval. Anything else? Um, no, that's it. It makes a really great snack. Um, a little trick, I will just give one last tip, is if you want to melt it down, I like to melt it down and put it in little molds to yes. make it just bite sizes for the kids because it is a it's a brick. It is a brick. <laughs> Get your keto bricks. Do it. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to get this conversation going and we are super excited to talk to you. So we always lead off with the question, what is the most critical problem you're currently trying to solve? I love this because um, I, I had to actually think about what am I struggling with, even though it's true. Like I struggle with different things all the time. I just, I have such a positive outlook that I, I think I just had kind of pushed it aside and just execute the, the plan. But um, what I'm struggling with right now is um, it's track season. That, that means it's track season for my daughter and her team, which I coach. And it's track season for me. And I have my clientele is like I'm full capacity right now. So a couple of weeks ago, I had a really great conversation um, with my friend Roxy, who I was on her podcast a couple months ago. And she was telling me like, so in order to get my message out, I need to do a little bit better job organizing and scaling. And so that's where I'm at right now is I'm trying to figure out how do I take care of everybody while still taking care of myself first, because not in a selfish way, but in a self-care way, because in order to take care of everybody else, I have to take care of myself first. Um, so it means I have to eat well. I have to get my sleep. I have to get in my training. Um, and then, you know, of course, I have to take care of my family. I've got to take care of my athletes. I've got to take care of my pets, the whole thing. You know, my husband, of <laughs> course, so like everything. So my struggle right now is juggling all of it and finding solutions to, um, you know, to the, to the struggle and executing that plan. So I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm accomplishing it. Um, I just, I decided to start a membership program. So because I can't take any more clients right now, um, so that way I can give more information to a group setting rather than, um, you know, individually working with clients every day on the phone. And also it's, it's you know, an Olympic year, thank God, fingers crossed. <laughs> and so my Olympians, especially at this point through July, are needing me a lot. So, and I'm really happy to be there for them. It's extremely important. Some of them, you know, I've been working with for years to get to this point. And I need to be able to be, available to answer their questions and um you know order supplements if they need supplements like whatever it is that they need um, they, they're always having some i mean there's always something in training right like there's you know you get a little um you know maybe something's going on with a certain muscle or you know you're looking for a little bit more recovery or what am i what's going to give me like that performance edge but it's safe that i can take but i'm not going to you know it's not going to be contaminated like there are so many questions that I have to answer for them. And then I have my regular clients who are usually autoimmune type issues and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I am happy to be there for so many people because to me, changing somebody's life through nutrition and training or especially nutrition is better than myself winning a gold medal. So of course I love being on the podium and winning a gold medal, but to me it's better when someone, my athlete says, Hey, I just had a personal best, or um, hey, I you know I qualified for the Olympics, or whatever it may be. Um, or one of my autoimmune clients says, um, "Guess what? I have no more neuropathy." Um, I had a client who had me almost in tears the other day because she said, um, "You know, people tell me that COVID, like they'll say to me, oh, COVID uh, 2020 was horrible,' and I say." you know what, actually, it was a really, really good year for me because I met Cynthia and now I don't have migraines anymore. Amazing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you're making cry. So sweet. But that to me is better than winning any gold medal. So how do I get that message across and reach more people and even little tidbits I can share, like um, I just wrote an article about sleep and uh, 
sleeping on your right lateral side will help your lymphatic, lymphatic flow, which we can talk about what that is, but it cleans your brain at night. And so little tidbits like that, like how can I share that with more people? So that was my struggle was I'm limited with what I have going on now. I got to figure out how to reach more people. So that's my struggle. And, and coach. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I understand that, you know, when I quit my job in 2018 and, and my whole first year of doing this was a nightmare, you know, just because everything seemed like a priority. And yeah. so like, you know, it's you really got to at, at that point, you start to be like, you got to be very jealous of your time, you know, got to be guarded with your time yeah. because you want to help people. But it's like when when people have so much access it's really hard because they don't understand that you're working on something else. You're writing, you know, you're doing something. Um, so I totally understand that one. And you're not the first person to, to mention that one. So um, people it's say that one. It's a good problem one. to have, but. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's getting past the whole like glorifying being busy because we all like to be busy. But then it's like, okay, right. after a certain point, it's like you're really busy, but are you being effective? And that's the the hard part is like creating systems to that can just be, you know, like you say, show up and execute, you know? So, well, that's a good one. So, you know, something I've heard people like you, um, Sean Baker, Ted Naiman, a lot of these people who are, they correlate, you know, health and vitality, which, you know, a lot of in today's health world, it's not the thing. It's like, what's your cholesterol, things like that. You know, they, they agree that we should be able to do more than just walk or do a light workout, um, and, and so I think the, the first place to start, because I want people to do, I love your message, you know, get people to sprint, you know, get people to, to get away from this, like, you know, uh, rat race lifestyle where they get, you know, go into a box, go into another box, right. hop on a treadmill for like an hour. Um, but like, what would you say to someone, even someone who might have been, you know, athletic, played college sports, did a power sport, but it's almost like there's like a mental block because I've gone through this. And the first time I sprinted like five years ago in years, I was I, I was afraid and I was like, wait a second, this is like riding a bike. But what, what do you tell people who want to get into this and, and want to start up with this like more intense form of exercise? Um, yeah, that's a great question because it is intimidating and sprinting itself is can be intimidating. So um, what I do, like I, I try to give a very slow step approach. So it's kind of funny. I always say start slow to be fast. Um, and what that means is don't just go out there and start sprinting um, full speed. Like that's not the way to do it. Um, there's a proper dynamic warm up I share um, on my YouTube and in my book, Fast Over 40. And then after that, I recommend usually starting to walk up a hill, especially if you're a beginner. Like if you have, you know, starting from scratch, you've never sprinted before and you haven't really been doing much. Um, start walking up the hill because that'll force you into the dorsiflex position, which is how your foot needs to be for sprinting. That means your toe is up and you're kind of on the balls of your feet. It'll start to develop your quads and your hamstrings and all the muscles you need for sprinting. So just start walking up a hill. Maybe, um, you know, I'd say maybe like a 200 meter hill is great. And so you start to build up these power muscles and the more advanced you can uh, you are, the faster you can go. And so the next step would be like an eight second sprint walk back. But you don't start at 100%. In fact, you, I would say you rarely sprint at 100%, except for maybe in a time trial or a race. You're really going to be between um, 80 to 95%. So you can start at 80% for uh, on a field because it's better for your joints and shin splints and things like that that develop when you first start intensifying your workouts. So you start on a field, you run for eight seconds after you do your hills. Uh, maybe I would say maybe three to four weeks of hills even. Do you, um, so you do can, you do you have them? Are they running on the hills after a while? Like yeah, uh, so walking the hills nice. and then progressing to starting to jog up, and then you can get a little bit more intense with your running. Just to, just taking it slow though, you feeling out, you know how you're feeling. Um, that actually can develop pretty quickly. So um, yeah, I'd say like a month of that, and then you can move to a field and do some eight second sprints, walk back, um, and then some longer ones. And then after that, you kind of have the choice between. Um, short interval training, long, uh, medium interval, and long interval interval training. So there are a whole host of workouts you can do after that, on the track or off the track. Um, so it's sprinting is great because you can pretty much do it anywhere. You can do it on a country road, you know, dirt path. You can find a hill. You can find a grassy field, um, and that's really important, I think, 
especially for the past year when COVID has shut down so many of the gyms, people are really looking for an alternative way to get a workout in. And the, you know, the long, slow distance is not really cutting it for anti-aging, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I like I like that you mentioned the the hill thing, because, you know, when I was in high school, I didn't know much. I was a sprinter. I was always fast. Um, I, I ran the hundred, the four by one and the 200 and could never do a 400. You're you're crazy. That's just oh, 400 is terrible. That's just, oh, my gosh. Oh. But I, if you I know used... track, you know, it's the worst race in track. Like anyone, because, any... because it's too long. It's like not long <laughs> well, enough it's, to slow down. It's, but it's, it's because it encompasses all three energy systems. Yeah. And that is, is, that is why it's a challenge. It's so but rough. Yes. Yeah. So anytime I, I meet someone that does a 400, I was like, oh, I know. Respect. You respect. psychologically. Yeah. yeah. You're well, a little and, crazy too. You're a little crazy. Right. <laughs> well, you know, like what I used to have, and, and it's funny because ever since this used to happen, you know, I would get a lot of hamstring issues back then. And in college, I focused so much on my posterior chain that I never had it again. But, you know, for those people who tend to, even they're lifting, uh, they tend to lift what they look at in the mirror. And, you know, a lot of you have a lot of muscle imbalances. So the hamstrings aren't that strong. And when you get that hill, you're cutting that you're cutting your stride. So you, you don't have as much exactly. of a of a risk for, of pulling a hamstring. So I really like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm so glad true. you mentioned that because strength training is a very important component. And I say I mentioned that in my book as well. Like you have to strength train. There's no way around it. And the best, even the best um, masters athletes who are still sprinting at 100 years old, the ones that are 80, you know, 80 years old, the ones I talk to are strength training for That's sure. Awesome. That's yeah. amazing. So, That's so amazing. Yeah. So, so I think the strength training is really important. And the posterior chain is extremely important for that. Like I, I think that's right on the money that you said that, that you stopped having those issues when you paid attention to it. Um, and I think a lot of even sprinters, um, beginning master sprinters tend to overlook this, I would say. Um, so yeah, strength training, absolutely important. And I, um, in my book as well, I give, that's why I was, it was, I was so passionate to give, um, my mentor was Charles Polican. So I picked some of his top strength coaches that trained under him and they contributed workouts. So you're actually getting from four of the best strength coaches in the country, their opinion on what you should do for strength training if you're starting to sprint. Like it's it's like a gold mine to me. I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, that is a gold mine. So great, yeah. So for anybody um, Malcolm, who doesn't, Malcolm William from Source Performance in uh, Arizona, he's my strength coach. Um, also, um, Ronnie Inserta, he's in Texas. Um, John McDowell, he's in Texas too. And Preston Green, my mentor, uh, who's the strength and conditioning coach for Florida Gators. Uh, ESPN and Sports Illustrated called him this year one of the best strength coaches in the country. So. I'm very I love that. <laughs> so for amazing. anybody who's listening to what she's saying, just it's the name of the book is Fast Over 40. So uh, if you're looking at this and you're listening and you got access to the to the browser, we'll, we'll have a link to the book in the uh, show notes. But yeah, definitely grab that book. <laughs> yeah. So Danny's Danny's last question was more on the macro level and you touched on it. So I'm glad that you touched on it. But more specifically, you know, before a training session, what are some of the vital components of a good dynamic warm up? Okay, um, so for a dynamic warm up, well, I, well, I have one specifically that I do, and it encompasses mobility, um, but that comes in the, kind of the middle. So at the beginning, you're starting to get your muscles warmed up, but um, I'm very careful. I see a lot of sprinters doing like a two a two lap jog or something before they sprint, and this is like no, not unnecessary, and trains the wrong twitch fibers. It's going to train your slow twitch fibers. You don't need to do this. So I propose instead to start out with like some strides where you're actually practicing your sprint form. Uh, it doesn't even have to be that fast to start with, but you're not in that jogging position and you're not shuffling, that kind of thing. So you do a couple strides and then um, you start to get your hip mobility and do some sprint drills. And then after that, there's a short yoga session. And then at the end comes the more explosive dynamic movements like skips, um, all kinds of skips and um, some jump squats and things like that. And then finishing with uh, 30 meter starts. And that's just basically like, you know, emulating what you would do off the blocks and then just kind of, st you know, slowing down once you reach like full, fully vertical, pretty much. Yes. You don't even have to be vertical. You can just stay low. Like, yeah, you want to stay low, but for beginners, I, just it's kind of a three-point start and you're just using your 
your power. So I guess you're, you're like practicing using your power, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Sense. Like practicing getting out of the, the, blocks, the yeah. blocks. Yeah. So for more advanced, you can keep your angle low. You can practice low heel recovery and that sort of thing. But for targeted towards beginners, we don't know anything about sprinting. We just keep it as using your power to start. Love it. Yeah. Well, well, I, you know, I wanted to ask you this question because like this year, you know, I, you know, sprinters hate running. I, you know, I, I, right. at least me, I've always hated it. I get it. that. I can I'll <laughs> sprint, but I do, when you like do like those runs, I'm just like, no. no. I, I hated track practice, like all of the sprinters, we always hated it. And it was like, <laughs> that makes sense. yeah, they're like 800 meters. What's that? <laughs> that sounds like eight <laughs> miles. Yeah. 800 yes. meters is eight miles to a sprinter. Totally. Uh, but you know, but this year it was like, it was all about doing hard stuff. And I did a lot of things like a lot of more endurance, uh, type of stuff. And, you know, obviously I think one of the reasons why people get into trouble with this long distance stuff is like, they, they spend a lot of time, you know, in that, you know, what, what Brad Kearns and, and Mark Sisson call the black hole, which is, you know, that the space between your maximum aerobic heart rate and your, uh, anaerobic threshold and um you know you're you're basically teaching your body to burn sugar versus fat um uh, but there's a lot of people that that do enjoy endurance and and that compete in, in endurance so i wanted to just get your thoughts on if someone does something like that what what your thoughts on a, on, a, on a training style like you know i don't know if you've heard of maximum aerobic function like the the math training you know what your thoughts are on that or or any just any advice that you would give to someone who who likes to do that type of training Okay, this is good because I just had someone the other day say to me, um, but what if, you know, we're having a discussion at the track and I was talking about how endurance training lowers testosterone and it actually um, interferes with estrogen as well. A lot of female endurance athletes will have irregular cycles and things like that. Like this is just widely known in the research, in the literature. Endurance training messes with hormones. Uh, okay, so I was talking about that and then this fellow was like, but what if she likes to run endurance? Like, what if she likes to run long distance? You can't tell her to just sprint. Like, she likes to do that. And I said, listen, if she wants to run endurance and keep running long distance, it's fine. But if she's coming to me and asking me, what is the best route for hormone balance or what is the best route for anti-Asian, I'm going to tell her it's sprinting, not endurance training. So if you like it, by all means, do it. If it's what gets you up off the couch, and exercising, by all means, please do it. But if you come to me and ask me, what is the best thing for your brain? What is the best thing for anti-aging? What is the best thing for hormone balance? It's going to be sprinting or other high-intensity type training. Um, so I guess if you are stuck in the endurance loop and you really love it, um, I would say just expect that you're going to have more oxidative stress um, you're not going to eventually at some point in some age, you're going to have injuries and you're not going to be able to keep up with the, uh, the nutrient um, requirements for all of the oxidative stress you're getting. You're going to have increased cortisol because of the stress on the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. Um, and you're going to have some hormone shifts. And so if you expect all of that and you're still on board, oh, digestive issues are another one. It actually, the type of exercise you do changes your microbiome. So, oh, um, interesting. yeah, so there's a, a really great study uh, in the Journal of Sports Medicine last summer, and it talks about how um, higher intensity exercise actually changes the enzymatic activity of your microbiome because of the requirements of having to change to a certain type of fuel, um, which is really interesting. And so a lot of endurance athletes have digestive issues. In fact, if you go on PubMed and you just type in endurance training, digestion, you'll come up with a whole, whole host of them. Um, so if you if, would like to still continue to endurance train after knowing all that, <laughs> then at least this is incorporate, all great to me because I don't care about this. <laughs> at least yeah. incorporate some speed work into your training. Yeah. Um, so I would say don't overdo it. A lot of endurance athletes are training like, you know, five days, six days a week sometimes. I'm like, well, this is crazy. Like maybe take a couple extra days off and change one of your days to speed training. Um, that would be my only solution for that. Otherwise, I would say the best formula I have found is lifting weights four days a week. Um, so resistance training 
uh, two lower body, two upper body. So maybe like a lower, upper, lower, upper with one day in between to allow your central nervous system to recuperate. Um, and then three days of high intensity training, such as sprinting, plyometrics, um, or other high intensity interval things. Somebody asked me the other day about uh, rollerblading, like speed rollerblading. I'm like, sure, but we're like, Describe to me what you're doing, and it turned out they were just rollerblading for a long, continuous time. I'm like, no, <laughs> like, <laughs> let's try rollerblading really fast for a short, maybe a short period of time, thirty seconds to a minute, and then you re- then you rest for two minutes, and then you do it again like that. So you can adapt to different things. Um, oftentimes, I have clients in the you know in the snow in the winter. They don't have my lovely Maui weather where I get to run on the beach all year. But um, so they have a. I suggest they get a rowing machine, an air rower, anything without electricity is always best. Um, because of the electromagnetic frequency interference on your muscles, but uh, maybe do some intervals on the rowing or the bike, that sort of thing. So you can have some different alternatives to sprinting. You can sprint on the bike, for instance, and cycle sprinting. Uh, but in general, I think the pounding, if you can get to from the grass to the track, the pounding that you put on your um, bones will actually make them stronger. Same type of thing with resistance training. So the, the stronger, you know, the more uh, impact you put on your skeleton, the stronger your bones are going to grow back with proper nutrition. So that's where the protein comes in. Yeah, I, I love that you said that. And, and, you know, that's why it's interesting because the people who need to know this the most, you know, are, are the ones that are doing the opposite. I mean, you see elite athletes, they spend probably, you know, 20% doing what you're saying, like sprinting, and the rest of it is very low intensity. It's not, and the, the typical person is like 50% in that black hole because that's when they feel like they're getting a workout. You know, it's like when they feel, um, and it's like they don't understand that that low level stress, you know, chronically is is killing them, you know, and then they're, they, they wonder why they have a tire around their waist and they wonder why, you know, their sleep is affected. So I'm all about it. I love, uh, you know, and, and who doesn't love being able to still jump through the roof and, mm-hmm. and all those things? Like, I really believe that that's that should be a bigger take a bigger part in like the health conversation, because, you know, if I have a good waist to hip ratio and I carry not a lot of fat on my on my waist and I'm able to jump and sprint, I mean, Maybe my cholesterol is high, which mine is, but I mean, that's like one of like several markers that we're looking at. You know, I have no inflammation, you know, my, my visceral fat is zero, you know, it's just, so I think yeah. they call that a lean mass hyper responder. Yeah. He's I've a lean mass that. hyper responder. 100% he's textbook. He's, he's yeah. totally Low triglycerides. Yeah. 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 I have a, I have a few clients like that and um, they're just, my gosh, they're thriving in all areas. And so that one marker, it doesn't tell the whole story. Yes. For sure. Um, yeah. But there are other folks out there who do have high cholesterol and they're addicted to sugar and then and they have high blood pressure. And then that's a dangerous combination. Right. So yeah. that that to them, I say, you know, for sure, let's let's um, get you on the fish oil and get you sprinting and, you know, working out because that's a dangerous combination. Um, but, yeah, it's not the full story at all, ever. And we need well, of course, we need cholesterol for our hormone balance. Like yeah. cholesterol is the precursor to our to our hormones and uh, so we need cholesterol we can't have low too low of cholesterol so yeah the cholesterol story that's gotten out of hand this, this past yeah, few years and, so and i'd hand. say gosh i don't even know i what would you estimate i'd say 80 percent of the population still doesn't know that cholesterol high cholesterol is not necessarily a bad thing yeah what even, would you even say 80 percent of people oh, yeah because yeah. even and in the keto even, community even within yeah it's crazy because even within the keto community even for our family which we've been doing this for so long and they're following low carb high fat diets and we've told them we've shown them the research we've pulled their trigs and they're still concerned they still want to take statins or well, well do they mom. have the, right you can look at your arteries to make sure they're not clogged which sean baker has done i love that he does that like you know zero arterial plaque I mean, yep. that's, that's, that's the, the most only association thing. that they, they refer to as, and then there, there's not even any evidence for that. Like, you know, high cholesterol does not equal a heart attack, but they're just saying, okay, you're more likely, but why is that? It actually has to do with the sugar, always the sugar, um, because that sugar binds and creates that plaque. Um, and it's the same thing with Alzheimer's. I'm very passionate about talking about Alzheimer's and 
um, how to decrease the risk for Alzheimer's, and that begins in our 20s. I think a lot of people are, they just, the research says the plaque starts building up in our 20s. And so we need to get proper sleep. Um, and also, these, even these athletes I'm working with, these Olympians, when they're in college at these amazing schools, um, you know, D1, best schools in the nation, and their head nutritionists are telling them to eat Pop-Tarts because they need sugar and drink Powerade because the, or Gatorade because the school's sponsored. Um, you know, I say they're doing them a great injustice because have they tested them for the APO4 allele? Because if they have the APO4 allele, then they can't process sugar very well and they're very likely to start developing plaque for Alzheimer's. Um, what, what if, of course they haven't done those genetic tests. They just say, okay, uh, you're, you need to burn glucose, so let's give you some sugar. <laughs> Instead of yeah. teaching them, there's a different way. Well, you know, and when I went, way. I went to school 2000 to 2004, and the other thing that that was like endemic everywhere was popping Vioxx. You know, just like just giving us, loading us up with Vioxx and other ACE2 inhibitors that are also associated with cardiac, you know, risk. So it's um, it's interesting. Like my mom has longevity in her family incredible genetics yeah like it's you know 107 105 she would live that oh, long awesome. regardless yeah she doesn't what have a great the, what ethnicity cuban cuban oh okay yeah nice. and uh and she you know she just got her blood work back and it was like high cholesterol high um ldl her hdl was like 80 and her triglycerides were like 60 you know everything you know so it's like you start to see why there's that correlation between high cholesterol on women and longevity. Yeah. She's a and perfect example. And we're trying example. to show her. And we're trying to, because she still doesn't believe it. And her diet is not great. So oh, yeah, we're trying to. Horrible yeah. too. The yeah. statins yeah. are terrible. Yeah. And we're trying and to show course, her. Like, I'm not suggesting anyone stop taking their statins because I'm <laughs> not a doctor. But I'm just saying, Same. like, they, there are so many side effects and so many, um, you know, things that are just, yeah. That and most of these things aren't meant for long term. And they just Correct. put you on them long term. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, they just keep keep them on. But um, what I, what I'm trying to spread the mission, and which you are too, is that there's a better way for long term. And a lot of that has to do with um, high protein, very animal based for me, of course, um, and uh, high fat for sure. Um, and it's not an an anti carb mes message for me. I think there's a time and place for carbs, but what kind of carbs? Um, I never ever uh, some uh, strength coaches do, but I don't have my athletes uh, intake grains if they do it's very very little but you'll never see rice on my nutrition plan <laughs> for my athletes ever so or oats um, it's just not there because they're so inflammatory and what about you know I, i've seen so many different situations with um, bacteria settling in joints and creating tendon inflammations and then um, nickel allergies are a big one lately i can really pinpoint wow. when someone has a nickel or a heavy metal allergy um yeah it's just it's really fun to be able to assess all the patterns of of what's going on with people and i'm i can even do it over the phone the other day i had this woman who was really awesome she was so sweet and we got to the end of our conversation and i said okay i'm reading the pattern and what i'm telling you is that it looks like you likely have a heavy metal some sort of heavy metal toxicity going on and she said hmm i think i know what it is i was i used to smoke for 30 years and i actually for the past um, couple of years have started vaping to try to get this try to stop smoking and I was like, oh, well, there you go. Vaping is strongly associated with heavy metal toxicity. Interesting. So it was like there was the answer right there. But I could, I could see from her symptoms and what she had going on and what she was telling me, because I, I get a lot of the story out, you know, more than what they want to tell me. I fish for more information. <laughs> um, but, yeah, and it tells me a lot about what's going on. So I'm usually able to, I mean, 100% of the time so far, I've been able to pinpoint what kind of, diet change or supplements would support them that's so empowering that's so cool i'm interested yeah that, that heavy i love you're speaking my language because i'm like always looking into this stuff like heavy metal toxicity and stuff so um what made you think that she like what are the things that you look for that tell you that somebody has an issue with um a heavy metal um, toxicity usually usually they have um some joint issues like continuous chronic joint pain um, that also can be inflammatory foods, which she had eliminated most of them, but there are a couple more that she could eliminate. Um, 
certain sleeping patterns, um, certain ways of being manic and then not manic and energy. Uh, it's really kind of different for everybody's story. Um, but if, if they have, if they have a reaction to cheap jewelry, a lot of times they have a nickel sensitivity and then that, it might not be a full blown nickel allergy, but that actually in turn, um, is aggravated by heavy metal toxicity. So that's a, that could be also an indicator of possible heavy metal toxicity. Wow. Super cool. But it, it kind of like, I have to get the full picture. That's why yeah, yeah, a yeah, lot of people story. say to me like, Oh, uh, in your book, I wanted you to tell me exactly what to eat. And I don't see that. <laughs> I'm like, You're I like, can't no, tell that's you. not how it works. I can't. Yeah, I can't because it's individual. Like I, that Ugh, to me, that's, I, I, I can give you a general idea, which I did is that you should definitely include red meat in your diet. I have a whole section on that, but I can't say exactly what you should eat because if you have a nickel allergy, then you can't eat walnuts say, but if, uh, or Brazil nuts, but if, you know, you don't have a nickel allergy and you have maybe some thyroid issues, then maybe the selenium and the Brazil nuts will be great for you. You know, so if I think you're zinc deficient, I'm going to recommend more zinc rich foods. So it, can, it just really depends on what your situation is, what you've got going on and um, what's going on in the pattern. Love I love it. that. We have one more question about more about performance and then we're going to get into the diet for sure um but you know we know obviously that you are a big advocate of sprinting over low intensity endurance training and we just had our friend brad kearns on just a few weeks back and he loves craig marker's approach of high intensity repeat training so hurt over hit what's your take you know on optimum volume frequency and rest periods for what for workouts like this so in other words what would a typical week look like <laughs> for you um, yeah, that's great. So I, okay, all the research says that the high intensity is where it's at for increasing BDNF, which is brain derived neurotropic factor. Um, if any, what, if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's basically a protein in our brain. That's like a fertilizer for neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is when your brain can learn new things, um, even motor skills, for instance, but also information. Um, it, uh, makes your gray matter in your brain there for a longer period of time, which a shrinkage of the brain is associated with Alzheimer's. So again, um, it's better for, uh, for staving off Alzheimer's. Um, so the high intensity works because the myokines that are released during that high intensity exercise are beneficial for clearing like the, the plaques in the brain and better for our brain health. Um, so that's kind of where it's at. Now, as far as the, the tempo and the intervals, I'd say um, changing it up is the best way. So you don't always want to do the same thing, which you know if you're in any kind of exercise um, program. Um, if you're familiar with strength coaching or anything like that, you can't keep doing the same thing. Um, so I would say that it's a progression. Um, so maybe if you're, I would say pick a goal for your year. So if you're just starting sprinting in May, then maybe you want to have a goal in, uh, once every three months. So maybe in August or something like that. And then again, another three months later, and then do a little progression towards that goal. So you're going to do a little bit longer, slower intervals to start and get faster and shorter, and then reset again. Now, if you're a trying, if you're going to be a master's athlete, which I hope a lot of people will be inspired <laughs> to sprint and Join me at my master's championships. That would be really awesome to see everybody there. Um, I've got actually one of my clients who's never sprinted before a few months ago. She is going to be in a, her first track meet here in Maui this Saturday. I'm so excited for her. Um, she used to run 5Ks, and now she has become a sprinter, and she's very happy. She's fit, almost 50. What is she What um, is she going to do? What, what, what event? She's going to do the 200 meters. Ooh, that's yeah. a killer. That's so, good. Yeah, so she's she feels not quite ready for the 100 yet as far as sprint technique and everything, but she's you know the 200 she can maybe go she won't probably won't even go 100 percent. she'll probably go 90 percent and then try again next week and go a little bit more so you know a very safe way to do it she's not it doesn't matter because whatever she runs is going to be personal best for her and then she can work from there so no pressure right uh, but she's really excited to actually like get on the starting line and get into a race um, so so for instance if someone was training for usually july is the outdoor masters national championship if they wanted to do that, then they would start their training maybe in um, August or September and maybe September. And then they would do that slow progression to peak in July. 
Um, so if that makes sense. So I guess my answer to that is it depends on the individual, where they're at, and um, but for health purposes, the high intensity uh, really gives a better anti-aging effect. Yeah, hundred percent. And I and I just I I I like that question just because I think a lot of people they um you know they look at everything from a from a certain standpoint so like they 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 think to themselves like if they if they were to rest for like three or four minutes which we're very used to doing as sprinters you know long rests they feel like they're not doing enough and they feel like they need to shorten their rest periods and then you know yeah. i just I, I like that idea just to bring that up so that people understand i look you'll get a better quality workout if you can do let's say eight you know at 90 percent versus like you do eight but you know the last four are like fast jogs because you haven't given yourself enough time to to rest you know so you can't put your all-out effort and all the things you're talking about come at that real that more intense you know creatine phosphate type of training so um that's why i thought there is something for to, to be said for 400 meter training and growth factor because the more you get into the lactic zone the more growth factor um, you know, you, you, uh, develop. So, and that's great for anti-aging as well. Um, but I would say, I mean, I spend a lot of time, I spend pretty much my life in that zone, <laughs> but also with sprinting as well. So I'm still, I'm, my coach actually has me at like usually 95% intensity at this time of year for my longer intervals. So I'll run a five or a 600 at 95%, uh, 400 intensity, which is, totally nuts but um (laughs) but what i'm saying is you can get to that point and you should include some of that lactic training in to your sprint workout because it's still a sprint you're still going above 80 percent um and you're definitely going to be you're going to get a better response as far as um you know getting your lymphatic system flowing and um, all kinds of stuff like uh, fat movement fat metabolism uh so i would say like i'm super excited about this membership community that I've, I'm developing. I we chatted about that earlier, but I was trying to figure out how to, you know, scale so that I could reach more people. So in that, I'm including three beginner sprint workouts per month. And so if you wanted to start sprinting, say, you could do uh, a short interval on Monday, a medium interval on Wednesday, and a longer interval on Friday. And that gets you used to all three types of sprints. They're still all sprints. Um, but that gives you a choice. And you can do that those three all month. And then the next month, I give you a different one, different set of those to keep changing it up, right? But in addition, I'm also sharing my training diaries, which is really appealing to my master's colleagues and anyone who's a little bit more advanced in sprinting. So obviously, if you're they're just beginning to sprint, they should not be attempting my times and my workouts. But if they're like, you know what, I, I think I want to try that you know, nine times 200 workout or something like that. Like, let, let me just see what at my level I can do per percentage. So the percentages will always be there. So maybe my time is not going to be as fast as the beginner sprinter time, but they can still estimate their percentage and execute the workout. Totally fine to do, but, um, you know, just so that they know it's not, they're not going to run the same times as me necessarily if they're beginning. Yeah. Or maybe some, you know, depends on maybe some men will, maybe you could you know <laughs> but, i don't know about the um, 400 the 200 used to be a lactic acid thing for me like <laughs> I, yeah I, you would love this this one i did the other day was the nine times 200 and it was three sets of three sets of three 200s the first one had to be very fast because again i'm in competition season so i'm having to run at very high intensities first one fast the next two were tempo in my flats so the first ones i, I ran in my spikes next two in my flats and then three sets of those I had three minutes rest in between each 200 only, and then three and a half minutes with, between the set rests. So only a little bit extra time. And my goal was sub 30 on the first 200, and then 32 to 34 on the tempo. And I went 27.0, 32, 32, 28.2, because I started to get really tired, right? I was getting very lactic. 31, came back a little bit faster on my flats, and then 32. And then my last set, I met this gal from, uh, she's going to Oregon, track and field in the fall, which oh, we, of course, know is like the best track program yeah. in the country. 
Oregon. Powerhouse. Oh my gosh, her quads were like. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> um, she was. She would be doing her her warm up skips, and it was like above the fence. It was insane. Anyway, so I was like, oh hey, like we were chatting, and I was like, hey, do you want? Do you, do you think you want to pace me, for maybe for my last fast two hundred? And I was like so beat because it was my seventh two hundred, and she, man, she paced me, and I ran twenty six. I couldn't believe I ran the fastest one in my workout, and I was just like, I did a post about. It just shows that fatigue is mental. And there's a lot yeah. of research on that too. Yes. That is if you can overcome and change your neurotransmitters, you actually get more energy from that. So I ran, ended up running, and then I ran a little bit slower on the next one, 34, of course, not 32. And then I ran a 32 on my last one. So it was a very challenging workout, but it was fun because I got to go fast and then I slowed down a little bit and fast again. So I'll get to share those training diaries as well. Um, and I'm not, I don't care about competition and, what if my competition sees what I'm doing? That's not who I am. I'm happy to share with everyone. So I, I'm always sharing. It's totally fine with me. So I'm, I'm really excited about being able to have a place to share all of this information consistently with everyone. I, I love what you said about that. I, I Actually, the first article I ever had published was back in 2006, and it was all about that. Like, And I called it No Idea is Original. You know, like, you know, you can do what I do, but maybe you can't do it the way I do exactly. it. You know, that's that's what I that's how I view it as a competitive athlete. You know, it's like mm -hmm. I'll give you what I do, but good luck doing it how I do it. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I can tell you that my coach gives me most of my workouts, um, and uh, he's tried other masters athletes have been like, oh, well, I want to work with your coach and this and that, and so he'll give them workouts, and not one of them has been able to finish his work. <laughs> wow. So, they're like either they took too long a rest or they gave up after the second interval or something. So they're very challenging, but they're there. I think the communication wise, you know, to the beginners that maybe join, it would be just make sure you're executing at your level because I'm all about becoming your superhero warrior self. That doesn't mean be somebody else's superhero version. Like I'm, I'm never going to run as fast as, you know, the, you know, a, 30 year old Olympian right now. Like that's just not what I'm going to do, but I am number one in the world for my age group and I am the best version I can be of myself at this age. And so that's what I'm trying to get people to do is be your best superhero warrior self. And I think we can continue to do that as we age. And so, like you said, we're not only can we um, not fall, but we can actually still be physically capable of so much as we age. And I've seen it. I've witnessed it. I've seen 100 year old, Orville Rogers, he just passed away recently, but um, 100 years old, 82 degrees at a track meet, running the 100, the 200, and the 1500. It, he was absolutely amazing. Lots of muscle tone. I would say lots of testosterone still. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. I would, yeah. I, so I'm... he was just so inspirational. And I think that, that's, that we're all capable of being that version of ourselves as we get older. And I'm just here to tell you that if you ask me, I'm going to tell you that long, slow distance and fruit smoothies are not going to be the route to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. All right. So I real quick before I ask this next question is uh, I just wanted I'm curious because this is like a big deal. Like, you know how when your co your coaches are always telling, you know, it's like with us when I was in high school, it was all about holding the potato chip in your fingers, you know, like just being, you know, as loose as possible. You know, <laughs> um, did you feel I would literally probably take that literal yeah, yeah. and be like i'm focusing so it, much yeah, on the it's just yeah. but it, it's <laughs> i get what they're here yeah it's just you know just you're not like Ugh. yeah uh and so i was i'm just curious like when she paced you like did you feel like you were just like you were just striding and opening up um oh, and then you gosh. look at the timer yes. and you see that you ran a 26 like totally exactly that's what happened that's so, crazy yeah. i love it seems that. like Relax. you're in my mind because only only runners really can probably get that but so yes, I was relaxed because I was just going off of her pacing and yeah. I felt her, I really felt her power next to me. Like I could feel, you could actually, I, I put a video on my Instagram of us running, my coach videoed it. You can see her hip drive is so freaking high that her knees come up way higher than my knees and I can hear the force of her feet hitting the ground and pushing off. Like I could, I could hear it. And that was in. That was like inspirational to me. I was yeah. like, oh my gosh, I hear the power. I can be powerful too. And I just kind of like, yeah. So my, my coach always says, drop your shoulders when um, he wants you to relax. So we don't do the potato chip thing, but <laughs> it's, it's drop your shoulders. So for me, if I'm, you know, tense, I'm not running 
faster than if I drop my shoulders and I have a nice relaxed stride. So that's what I was able to do. And you're right. I mean, I love that you said that because it was like you're inside my head. Yes, that's, that's totally that's what cool. happened. I just, I, I, I was yeah. curious. I figured that, you know, I, I was, I was thinking that that's what happened. Um, so that's really cool to see. Cause like you, you get to see like, wow, if you had someone like that to train with all the time, you know, you're not in this, like, you're not fighting yourself, you know, you're, you're just focused on your form. So yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I um, I guess we'll talk about, we mentioned this, but you know, we can't end, end this without mentioning this because you're a woman, you're over 40, you're a sprinter, <laughs> you cycle in and out of carnivore, you eat an animal based diet. So I want for women that are listening to this, whether they're young or you know, I don't want to say old because, shoot, I'm 40. So it's like... Never call women old. <laughs> <laughs> we never get old. No, never. I never ask a, a woman's age or her or weight. And if they make me guess, I'm like, I'm not going to guess that. I'm not going to do that. That's a, that's a minefield. But um, yeah, what would you say as f from a performance standpoint? You've kind of alluded to some of the things like the bone mineral density and things like that. But how can eating an animal-based diet... Because let's say someone wants to do sprinting, but they're still stuck on this like... They got to eat these big old salads and they don't want to eat a lot of red meat. Um, how does that translate into performance? Um, yeah, so I'm a really big fan of red meat for a lot of different reasons. But um, the main things are I actually eat steak an hour before I race, um, which is, you know, fun. I'm up there in the stands indoors or I'm on the field outdoors eating my, I have like usually a little baggie and a cooler bag and I'm just sitting there eating my steak. Um, and that's because it's really full of uh, carnitine, carnosine, um, uh, all the things that I need for my performance. So I need the carnitine for my uh, explosiveness, and the carnitine, of course, buffers lactic acid. So I'm almost like, why wouldn't you eat steak before you race? Um, a lot of people will supplement beta alanine instead of uh, to, as a precursor to carnitine. But what studies have found is that carnitine is actually 85% more bioavailable in beef. Um, so it, instead of supplementing beta alanine, which sometimes I will in con conjunction with the steak, which works really well, um, I'm really just intaking that pure carnosine that's um, able to be absorbed. And um, the reason it's, I'm able to absorb it so well is because I constantly eat animal protein as the first bite of my food. And when you do that, you, in, uh, you increase your stomach acid, so you decrease your pH. And that's important because you're able to um, digest your food better, so you're able to digest protein better, um, you're able to absorb your nutrients better. And of course, when you have high acidity in your stomach, which we're meant to have a low pH, um, you're able to ward off viruses and pathogenic bacteria better. So people who are on a plant-based diet are they're actually their their pH will increase and they'll get less stomach acid and they're more likely to get pathogenic bacteria um, and viruses that way. Um, there's a whole list of reasons why plant-based can, can be potentially dangerous. But for performance, it's great because I've got my protein to make sure as I age that I'm getting my muscle mass, like my lean muscle mass. Um, my one of my favorite doctors is Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, and she's always oh, talking about yeah, muscle is the organ of longevity, and she is absolutely correct about that. That's some writing here. Um, because the more muscle we have as we age, the more our hormones are going to be balanced. Because they, you know, our muscles are our muscle tissue is responsible for so many different parts of our our aging. And so, uh, if we have a good amount of lean muscle mass, then we're better for our hormone balance and all that. So. I want that for my performance as well, so that I'm strong enough to perform my sprint. Um, so if I don't have enough animal-based protein, then I'm not thriving as much in my, you know, in my performance. So I think that's a, a huge part of it. Um, of course, I learned that from my mentor Charles as well. He was a big proponent of animal-based protein, and so I, yeah, I rotate, but I am very firm believer in having red meat five to seven times a week at least. Um, some people don't eat organ meat. Some people do. I like to incorporate liver. Um, three mm -hmm. ounces once a week or, um, you know, maybe every two weeks. Uh, it's full of vitamin A and also B12 and folate and more protein. So, yeah, it's just, uh, I would say it's greatly misunderstood because of false ep epidemiological studies. And so if you're afraid of red meat, come talk to me, ask me some questions. I'll give you all the reasons why it's good for you. Um, grass-fed is usually best. I'm not knocking conventional if that's all you've got, 
but if you have the choice and you're able to get grass-fed, grass-fed has more omega-3s. Um, it, actually, I just talked about, I had a little post on grass-fed liver and how it has more ret retinoids and carotenoids, which are great for you know your eyesight and all kinds of brain health. Um, more of that in grass-fed than conventional uh, beef liver as well. Um, did I, I hope I answered your question. No, you off totally on these tangents did. with nutrition. So. No, we no, love it. I, I love yeah. all this stuff. I mean, we you love got, liver. You get we creatine too. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's yeah. so good for, have you so, noticed that it's so good for your skin too? Like to me, that's the best thing for my skin is liver. Well, um, that's because it's high in glycine. Yeah. So I have a whole, yeah, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm not anti putting collagen in your coffee, but I'm kind of anti putting collagen in your coffee. I'm, I'm a little controversial about that. Yeah, because yeah like that's not going to. Well, if you like get bad collagen, collagen, that's a heavy metal thing too. Exactly. And if and I'm like, what kind of collagen are you using? And then they're like, oh, yeah, it's um, algae or something. And I'm like, marine based. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Because like, you know, the algaes are very high in heavy metals. So um, because they're basically sponging and soaking up everything from the sea. So, but even if it's an animal-based collagen, um, my question is like, what is the point? What are you trying to do? Is it for your skin? Because then you just really need to intake more glycine and you can do that through supplement form as well. My favorite one is um, Glutamed by ATP Labs. It's glutamine and glycine. Um, and that's and sweet. I, it's, it's like- Yeah. Sweet. Glycine is a little yeah. sweet. Yeah. Right. Well, it forces like glucose into your cells without spiking your insulin. So it works really well for, for that. Um, but also it's in, you know, if you're cooking a chick, a whole chicken, for instance, it's in the skin, it's in the bones. So maybe make yourself chicken soup instead of collagen powder yeah. all the time. I don't know. I just feel like it's like an unnecessary trend right now. If that yeah, makes I totally, sense. totally and, understand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's multiple when, times more expensive. And it's too. so expensive when you can like just when you can get yeah, it off the bone. Meat yeah. And like make some broth, have some broth going. Right. And so um, now AT, ATP actually just came, ATP is um, who sponsors me, I should say. So they've sponsored me for a few years. I'm just very grateful to them because they're, um, they're artificial free. So they have no artificial colors or flavors and they test every batch for inform, informed sport approved. So that to me means I can uh, compete. And if I get drug tested, it's not contaminated. So it's very important. So I love those guys, but they just came out with a collagen product. And um, the only reason I really like that one is because it has go-to cola in it. You guys know about go-to cola? No. no. Go-to cola? Oh, yeah. It's one of the best things for your skin, actually. You should look it up. G-O-T-U-K-O-L-A. So I think, they, I think they did something different by putting that go-to cola in, like, where I can actually feel like I'm behind it. You know, otherwise, I would have been like, oh, I don't know if I can promote this product, you know? <laughs> like, I'm so kind of like, oh, collagen powders again, you know? Yeah. But um, go-to cola, I actually have my clients um, put it, they, they intake it as a supplement, and then they sometimes put it on their skin if it's mixed with an oil. Um, I've got a local guy that does some here. It's called Maui Medicinals, and he does it mixed with olive oil um, and some mixed with alcohol. So if I wanted to use it as an astringent or something like that, I could too. But it's really great for skin. Um, my mentor, Charles, used to suggest it for people who had loose skin. Maybe they lost a lot of weight and they have that loose skin thing going on. Um, so he said for some reason, like it was a, what did he call it? Like a, when, when things build up, I'm losing the thought, train of thought right now, but um, like, a, like a, not satiating, but when you reach, reach max capacity on a mineral. Oh, uh, yeah, saturated? Like saturated, like a saturation yeah. issue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's another word, but I'll think of it. So um, basically... He said if you use it for like seven months topically, it'll seem like nothing's happening. And then almost all, all of a sudden overnight, it'll happen. Like your skin will shrink up. Um, yeah. So maybe saturation is a good good way of putting it. So go to cola. Excellent. I'm actually going to see. I really love coconut oil. I'm a big fan of the antifungal, antimicrobial properties of coconut oil. So I'm actually going to reach out to this fellow and see if he'll make me some go to cola with coconut oil. I think that'd be fun. Topical. Uh, maybe, yeah, oh, yeah, that would yeah be great. topical with some, maybe some fractionated so it won't harden in the winter months. But I have no issue with hardening, but because <laughs> I'm Whoa. in Maui. <laughs> but my, I've noticed my clients in the mainland sometimes do. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to reach out to him and see if he'll make that for me. Very That's cool. awesome. Yeah. Well, we. This was awesome. Um, yeah, well, actually, so much fun with you guys. I wish you guys were here in Maui. We could hang out. <laughs> I know. Gosh, I'm so jealous. Oh, you mean like our last question? Yeah. 
It's really just, you know, I'll ask oh, about, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll be working. So yeah, like, so you got the book, um, you're working on the subscription. Um, is there anything else you're working on and where can people find you online? Thanks. Um, yeah. So the membership launches May 1st and, um, I'm super excited about that. It's going to be a different theme every month. So I'll have a whole month dedicated to digestion, a whole month to hair, skin, and nails, a whole month to inflammation. Um, so lots of information on that. Um, uh, and I am still competing, so I'm competing right now and I'll probably compete in the summer, um, in July. And um, my website is mam808.com. Mam stands for Metabolic Analytics of Maui. So I'm a metabolic practitioner. Um, and on Instagram, I post almost every day. I'm at Fast Over 40. The number I love 40. That. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you, Cynthia. I don't know if it's Cynthia or CM. I don't know which one you prefer. But... You can call me Cynthia. It's All right, fine. cool. <laughs> thank you so much. This was great. This is awesome. Thank you so much for yeah. coming on. That was fun. Thank you. It was my pleasure. 